Welcome to Crane Women in Music Education. I'm Katherine Sherman. And I'm Tracy Wanamaker. Tonight you will hear from Dr. Karen Collins, Department Chair of Music Education, Crane alumni Melinda Phoenix Hart, Jennifer Moore, Dr. Melissa Natal Abramo, Genevieve Brigida Lotz, Marichelle Weil, and students Diana McKendy, Kaylee Junes, and Margaret Rempe. We will share stories and examples of how the Crane School of Music has been a tradition of innovation throughout its 132 year history and how women music educators have been a driving force that continues today. On behalf of our music education department, thank you for coming tonight and celebrating the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage and the legacy of Julia Crane. During the late 1800s and early 1900s, the educational world was dominated by the masculine influence of music educators such as Luther Whiting Mason, Hosiah E. Holt, John Wheeler Tufts, Hollis Dan, and Thomas Tepper. The impact of a woman in music education was extremely rare. However, Julia Crane appeared in this list of music innovators. Her music institute continued with the leadership of strong women such as Maria Schutte and Helen Hosmer. Robert Gibbs, during SUNY Potsdam's 100-year anniversary celebration in 1986, described the entire atmosphere of the Crane School by stating, Julia Crane, Helen Hosmer, and our women faculty have been not just the skeleton, but also the heart of the committed body. So who was Julia Crane and her family? Julia Eddy Crane was born on May 19, 1855 in Hewittville, New York, located in the North Country. Julia lived in the village of Potsdam with her parents Samuel from Maine and Harriet K. Bissell from New Hampshire, along with her five younger siblings, Jesse, A.J., Hattie, Daisy, and Violet. Her father, Samuel Coggershaw Crane, participated in the gold rush of 1849, then returned east where he cleared a farm, operated a sawmill in Hewittville, later a chair factory, and finally served as a justice of the peace in Potsdam. Julia began studying piano at the age of 11, and by age 14 gained a well-known reputation on piano and voice in local church choirs, singing schools, and music festivals. Julia Crane and siblings are pictured here clockwise from top left. Harriet Crane Bryant, Alan Jerome Crane, Jesse Crane Moore, Daisy Crane Sisson, and Julia E. Crane, seated on the steps of the Crane Normal Music Institute, 53 East Main Street. So, how did it all begin? I was finishing the day in my vocal studio when the president of the Normal School Board called. The teacher of music in the school had resigned and he came to ask me if I would take the position. I answered promptly, oh no, I am doing a piece of work which is very enjoyable, which leaves me quite free to go and come as I like. And every year, my class increases. But, said Mr. Watkins, the normal school position requires only one period of class teaching per day, conducting in the singing chapel and preparing for commencement and other school exhibitions. You may have all the rest of the time to continue your voice work. To make a long story short, our discussion of the matter grew more interesting, and I finally told Mr. Watkins that one class period per day was not sufficient time in which to do the work in music that ought to be done in a normal school. That the only thing that would tempt me to take the position, which would be the privilege of working out a plan, which had been in my mind from the time I completed my normal co course. Mr. Watkins listened with great interest and finally said, Miss Crane, if you will take this position, I promise you that I will do everything in my power to make it possible for you to work out your ideas. The outcome of the matter was that I accepted the position at a salary of $300 per year and began work in September 1884. One of the happiest moments of my life was the day I met the new principal when he said, how are you going to prepare teachers of music for the public schools in one period per day for 20 weeks? 
how gladly I acknowledged that I knew it could not be done, and that it was only because of the promises that I might work out a better arrangement that I had accepted the position. The music program for the normal students made it possible for any student who so desired to study music throughout the four years course. Meanwhile, some of my voice pupils entered the normal school and uh, in cl with classes in sight singing and music methods with the idea of fitting themselves for teaching music in the public schools. This was the beginning of the course which has developed into a training school for music supervisors. This phase of the work began in 1886 and in 1888 were graduated the first special music teachers ever sent out from any normal training school in the United States. Julia knew that music was more than a lovely performance, and she desired that her music students teach music as an important educational process, rather than merely a showy product. Yes, because a love of for rhythm is as universal as the love for shun sunshine and flower, and because almost any entertainment in which children are performers is pleasing to parents, there is a tremendous demand for music in the school exhibitions. In most towns, of, of music schools are judged entirely by the attractiveness of the entertainment. But the day of reckoning must come, for eventually the schools will be asked to show practical results from the musical instruction provided. If these results are not forthcoming, is the instruction in music all that it should be? Dr. Melissa Natala Bramo has answered that question. She currently is both an educator and department chairperson in the North Salem Central School District in North Salem, New York. Dr. Abramo teaches music and gifted and talented and leads teachers in music, art, family consumer sciences, and technology. She is a proud graduate of the Crane School of Music with a degree in flute performance and music education. Dr. Abramo completed her master's degree at Northwestern University and her doctorate at Teachers College, Columbia University, both in music education. Her approach to teaching is one that ultimately embodies curiosity, and exploration. Dr. Abramo's hope for her students is that they experience her classroom as a place where they can not only learn how to play and perform music, but ultimately experiment with and experience music as a creative art form. This could take the path of high school students creating music or multimedia presentations in a music production course, or young band students exploring how expression markings change the way we hear and express the music we learn. Her uh, pedagogy borrows from the tradition she learns herself as a musician, as well as the rich pedagogies in fields such as media literacy, inquiry, and problem-based education, and social-emotional learning. <laughs> Do you think that melody now? Actually, 
How does changing the style, you call that staccato, right? How does that change it for you? I think it's kind of like more. It's kind of like a storm. Sounds like a storm. Why do you think it sounds like a storm? What is it? Jack, you know it's angry. During the beginning of Ms. Crane's teaching career, the field of education was built upon two competing ideas. One was the result of past pedagogical practices of memorization and recitation that were popular in the mid-19th century. The other was the beginning of the progressive education movement of the late 19th century, which placed a focus on creative exploration by the student rather than the instructional method of the teacher. In the subject of music, this dichotomy was demonstrated in the musical experiences of students versus the perfection of teaching music reading. Thus, a new emphasis of song singing was developed as a reaction against the emphasis on note reading and the neglect of musical expression. Unfortunately, neither note reading nor musical singing was taught through a collaborative approach. This was, of course, until the innovative educational ideas of Ms. Crane. She understood that children needed the best of both educational philosophies to gain the most beneficial qualities of learning. Senior student Maggie Rempe shares how the variety of educational opportunities she has received at Crane has impacted her philosophical approach to teaching. Maggie has been involved with music nearly her whole life, taking her first piano lesson at the age of five. This fostered her love of music. However, it wasn't until late into her high school years that she decided music education was her path. Now, she can't see herself doing anything else. Maggie has gained much through the variety of teaching experiences provided through our music education program. She has been involved in many practicums offered at the Crane School of Music, including piano pedagogy, general music practicum, teaching beginning instruments, and special education music practicum. Her most rewarding experience has been the Jamaica Field Service Project. The 10-day experience included one uh, teaching week in an underprivileged Jamaican primary school where the days were spent teaching drumming and various songs with movement. Not only did she get invaluable teaching experience, but she was also able to immerse herself in an unfamiliar culture and understand how important music can function within one. Currently, Maggie is student teaching in the Brentwood School District on Long Island. This district is predominantly comprised of students from minority populations, as well as lower socioeconomic backgrounds. So far, one of Maggie's most important takeaways has been the value that should be placed on knowing who you are teaching and working to build meaningful relationships with your students in order to help them be successful. She believes that by knowing the community you are about to step into, you can be prepared to help your students in the best way for them. From here, Maggie looks forward to meeting the thousands of students she is going to reach throughout her career as a music educator. She aspires to be an educator who not only gives students the tools they need to be lifelong appreciators of music, but inspires them to be successful members of society that give back to their communities in ways that are meaningful and musical. Maggie wishes she could thank each of the professors who she has been lucky enough to work with today, but would like to especially thank Young Ah Talk, Catherine Sherman, Jennifer Kessler, and Tracy Wanamaker a few of the inspiring women she has been lucky enough to work with here at Crane. Shall we not concede then that the important thing is to so to teach that each day 
gives the student greater power to solve his own problems. Any plan which can be made before teaching the class is necessarily inadequate. Each day's work should be planned from the needs of the individuals in the class, with a purpose to be accomplished clearly in mind, and with the aim of making the lesson a helpful link between the work already done and that which is to be done in the future. If this work is so planned that each step the power, ability, and the taste of the child are considered in relation to his highest development, music must take its place as a vital factor in education. Crane alumna Genevieve Bridget Alotes is just that type of teacher that Julia describes. She designs her music education curriculum so that each step so that at each step, the power, ability, and taste of her students are considered in their relation to their highest development. Genevieve received her Bachelor of Music and Music Education with a special education concentration and a focus in saxophone from Crane, where she later received her Master of Music and Music Education. Since 2014, she has taught at PS204 Morris Heights in the Bronx, New York. Her music classes include pre-K through fifth grade general music, choir, dance, and an extracurricular musical theater program. As one of the top rated and highest performing schools in District 9, PS204 fosters partnerships with programs such as the Child Mind Institute and Yale and Harvard Universities that encourage social and emotional learning and wellness in students and staff. Genevieve has taken a leadership role within PS204 to encourage and support the development of the school community. My name is Genevieve Bridget Lotes, and I am an elementary music teacher at PS204 Morris Heights School in District 9 in the Bronx, New York City. A highlight of my musical career has been working alongside my students to learn more about who they are as people and as artists. Many of my students truly love and participate in the arts, whether it be singing, dancing, drawing, writing, or simply listening to music throughout their day. Like most young music teachers fresh out of college, I entered the field with the best of intentions. However, my lessons included content that I merely assumed and hoped my students would like, instead of what they actually liked. I did not begin with my students' interest at the center of my teaching. I used February, Black History Month, as the only time to address the civil rights movement and influential African American people in the arts. I assumed that all students needed to learn Western notation before they left fifth grade because that's how I grew up. I'm fortunate to be the only music teacher at our school, so I see many children grow up year to year at PS204. Through six years of conversations, experiences, successes, and challenges with my students, I have learned the importance of empathy. So many students yearn to be heard, understood, and accepted for who they are, as well as how they are growing into their own identities. Once I consciously put that at the center of my teaching, relationships and connections that were made intertwined with students feeling more accomplished and open in their music work. In this video, you meet a few fifth grade students who I have seen grow into incredible artists who are learning to embrace who they are and assert their own styles into their music work. I have known a couple of them since they were kindergartners at PS204. The objective of their project is to choose a song that resonates with you and teach yourself how to play it using any resource you can find. Aminata is a fifth grade student who has been working on Scars to Your Beautiful by Alessia Cara. She began learning the notes on piano after finding resources online with the piano letter notes. She is now choreographing a dance that connects to her song. Why did you decide to do this song? I decided to choose the song because it has a message that, that and it lets you express yourself the way you are. Talk about what you had to do in order to learn this song. In order to learn this song, I used um, a sheet of music, not sure. necessarily a piano sheet of music, but the ones with the letters. Yeah. Because I'm not really comfortable with piano sheet right now. <laughs> Currently, I'm using a piano book that actually has the notes and everything, and it's actually helping a lot. And how do you feel now after you've accomplished what you have? 
I feel I feel proud of myself because I accomplished a lot on the piano and using the sheet music. And also Miss Bridget for helping me out. <laughs> Christian and Matthew are fifth grade students who love Travis Scott. His song, Butterfly Effect, was their first choice when they started their project. Unable to find a non-traditional form of notation, I was able to help them explore Western notation and concepts of melody and accompaniment. And the most challenging, when I started doing like the melody of the lyrics, it, for me, like I thought it was really difficult at first, but like, when I started doing it more and more, it started being fine. How do you feel about feel, what you've done? I feel proud of myself. Yeah. Why is that? Because we actually are done with it. <laughs> like, normally I wouldn't do something like this. Like, finishing a whole chorus of a song mm -hmm. and actually doing the beats. In like a couple of days. Yeah. So it's amazing. Like, only a couple of weeks. Brian and Shaquin are fifth grade students learning Panini by Lil Nas X. They learned the song on piano using an online video tutorial. Both talented artists, the boys decided to add digital art components to their work. The artwork will be displayed while they play the song for their showcase. It can be described as like a, to try and stop bullying. So it's, it's like a way that he's trying to show that, that everyone can be different in their own ways and is not to care what other people think. But I had to learn. I had to like kind of get, because every time I like a new song, um, I had to kind of like listen to it like a thousand times before I know the whole song. Mm -hmm. um, we had to do that like every day. We almost got tired of it at one point. Like I'm tired of hearing the song. But, um, <laughs> yeah, we ended up learning. The, um, we even learned the little things he would say like in the background. Yeah. The song, so. We really like. Like, it's like we know the, the lyrics like the back of our hand now because we would search it up and we would keep, keep, keep saying it to ourselves. So it's like something that we remember now. So how do you feel now after you've accomplished what you have? Uh, feels um, pretty good. So, yeah. Why? Because we've done a lot of work. And, and before this, I, I was thinking that like we, we, we wouldn't have much to, to say, but now that we're actually like we're doing progress, it feels, it feels like we know more than what we did before this project. the likes or dislikes of an adult, or even the speculations of the mature mind are no proper basis for methods of teaching children. The child's tastes, his various states of mind and body as he passes from infancy to manhood must decide these methods. If music holds its place in the public schools, it must meet the demand of the children. What is this demand? It is a demand for the power and the means of expressing themselves. Music opens up one of the most universally available avenues for active self-expression that is known to man. Musical instruction must be so conducted in the schoolroom that it takes a dignified place in its relation to the other work of the school. It must enable the pupils to do things. Teach knowing that your work must stand for all eternity. Crane music education student Diana McKenty does teach to meet the demands of her students. She designs her instruction to match their demand for the power and the means of expressing themselves. Diana will introduce an example of this now. Good evening. My name is Diana McEntee and I am a senior music education major on the general music track with a concentration in piano pedagogy. It is an immense honor to walk in the footsteps of the woman who helped build Crane and all those who followed. Their lives and impact on music education were foreign to me when I first decided to transfer into Crane three years ago. However, I am proud that their past is now interwoven into my teaching philosophy. The teaching excerpt that I will share with you today 
largely exists due to the piano ped pedagogy courses I have completed under the guidance of a current Crane woman music educator, Dr. Sherman. In Dr. Sherman's courses, we explored road teaching and improvising, two areas in which I used to be utterly inexperienced in. My student, Katie, is a brilliant young lady and quickly developing pianist. First, you will see me demonstrate a blues chord progression. Katie loved the sound of the chords so much that she asked if I could teach them to her, so I did. Showing Katie the chords by rote allowed her to play more advanced material quickly and fluently. Next, you will see me, me improvise while Katie accompanies, and then we will switch roles. My piano education before Crane consisted primarily of learning music by standard notation, and opportunities to improvise and take musical risks were limited before my first jazz band experience in community college, and it was terrifying. <laughs> However, I want to empower my students to exhibit creativity through improvisation and explore multiple modes of learning outside of notation. Because of Dr. Sherman and creative and talented colleagues, my piano students, like Katie, will not possess the same fear and lack of, conf of confidence I had to take musical risks. So three, four, or four, four. So one, two, three, one, two, three, or one, two, three, four. It's gonna three. sound. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> You're like me. So, okay, this would be three. means for accomplishing the ultimate ends of school music, any one of which taken alone seems to me entirely inadequate. Any one exclusively employed must necessarily fail because it touches but one side of a many-sided piece of work. We all have seen schools in which the element of joy and achievement have been entirely eliminated 
by well-meaning but mistaken teachers who did all of the work themselves, expecting the pupils to grow by the process of absorption. I remember visiting a class in which this condition existed to a marked degree. The pu pupils were listless or mischievous, the teacher enthusiastically singing and expecting the children to follow. I asked a small boy later why he was so naughty in that class, and he responded promptly, there's nothing to do. The teacher has all the fun. I believe the best results can be secured through a combination of song singing, music reading and writing, lessons in music appreciation, and opportunities for the study of some instrument. Kaylee Junes provides opportunities for her students to do all that Julia describes, and in her classes, they certainly do have all the fun. Kaylee is in her fourth year here at Crane as a music education student. Her concentrations in choir and special education have given her the opportunity to teach four different practicum courses over the last two years. She taught general music at the SUNY Potsdam Child Care Center, elementary choir at St. Mary's School, and general music for self-contained classes at Lawrence Avenue Elementary and A.A. Kingston Middle School. Outside of classes, she has taught at Potsdam's Colts Day, Ousden Summer Camp for the Arts, and Erie One Bosey Summer School. Kaylee frequently uses lessons centering around movement and play to keep students engaged and are the, sorry, <laughs> and at the center of the learning process. The following selected media shows excerpts from some of these lessons. The activity featured in this video is a musical game called Apple Tree that Kaylee adapted to help students connect their bodies with their singing voices, as well as deepening their understanding of musical dimensions. Each round of Apple Tree involves students singing a song and walking in a line to the beat. Before each round of the game, one student would choose a musical dimension to dictate their performance. For example, if a student chooses forte, Students would not only sing loudly as they walk, but they would also take bigger march-like steps. As the rounds progress, Kaylee asks questions to check for conceptual understanding, and the game continues. This is one of the students' favorite activities in her general music practicum class. It's going to get long, so we have to make sure that we're walking really long steps. Here we go. Here we go. Apple tree, apple tree, will your apples fall on me? I won't cry, I won't shout, if your apples not sweet at all. Uh, uh, <laughs> if your apple not sweet at all. summarize, Ms. Crane describes her teaching philosophy. If the teacher is ready to respond to the thoughts of the pupils as they are to hers, she will soon find a freedom of execution and a refinement of expression that have ne not been dreamed of before. Crane alumna Marisha Weil is always ready to respond to the thoughts of her pupils. In this video, Ms. Weil will share an overview to how she teaches her music and media class about Motown music. She provides multiple contexts for students to observe, discuss, and reflect on the music, people, and culture of the genre, so students understand Motown from multiple angles. 
Some of the themes in this unit include race, gender, power, and control. Ms. Weil guides students through discussions of these issues in a safe, supportive, and non-confrontational manner. Through this unit, she strives to develop empathy, understanding, and perspective in her students. I'll be sharing my approach to teaching Motown music to my music and media class, which combines music technology as well as the history of rock and hip hop. In this unit, we learned about the musical stylings of this genre, the culture of Motown music, and its implication on race and gender. The two documentaries I like to use to introduce students to our unit is Motown Invasion from BBC and The Motor City's Burning, both of which can be found on YouTube. Some of the highlights we discuss in class are the significance of having a black-owned record company, Motown Records. Additionally, we examine the look that Motown Records put out and its implication. For example, if we look at this picture of Martha and the Vandellas, we can make observations that reflect the culture surrounding Motown music. Some of the observations my students made were that the performers were all wearing the same outfits. Additionally, they all have large wigs on, which look similar if not identical. This is culturally significant for two reasons. Firstly, it created the idea of glamour and wealth. This polished, glamorous look is what allowed black artists to be suitable, quote unquote, for a mainstream white audience. Secondly, by designing all the women in the performing groups to look identical, it was easier for the record companies and producers to swap out girls if they ever started acting out. In other words, it was a way of keeping control over women. In addition to examining the treatments of women, we also learned about the racial tensions in the United States and how it showed itself in Motown music. We saw images of police brutality towards the African American community and discussed how the artists in Motown responded to it because the glamorous portrayals of black artists in Motown did not represent the poverty and cruelty black America was facing in the real world. To do this, we examine the song Love Child by the Supremes. Here you can see a copy of the lyrics I printed out for students to examine. Their assignment was to find details in the lyrics that alluded to the struggles of an impoverished black youth in America. As an aside, this assignment also serves as a great way to demonstrate the crossover between music and ELA. We discussed each line the students highlighted as a class and determined how they supported the overall message of the song. We then compared this message song with one that was written just a year earlier by a famous European band, The Beatles. After listening to both and examining their lyrics, students were asked to compare and contrast the two songs in order to determine the significance of the messages of these songs. Here's the final comparison that we came up with. Students made some excellent observations as to the differences between the two. When asked if the artist would be able to switch songs and have the same meaning, they unanimously agreed that it could not be the case. As one student observantly put it, the Beatles weren't even drafted. They were on the outside looking in. The Supremes were living it. They were on the inside looking out. I enjoy this unit because it allows me to talk about racial and gender inequity with students in a way that's not so controversial. This project helps them understand perspective. The story of the impoverished, black woman described in Love Child is a narrative that comes from black voices in similar circumstances. Music is not colorblind, but will often represent the voice of the outcast. Finally, we finish this unit by watching the movie Dream Girls, or at least parts of it that I pre-selected, where students had to make correlations about what we learned in class to what we saw in the movie. This added an emotional element where students felt anger, sympathy, or joy for the different characters. I think this activity added another layer of understanding because it showed the people of Motown as humans. The information they learned about became less about the facts and more about humanity and ethics. Here you can see the graphic organizer that the students used to hold on to their thinking as we watch the movie. Once they had their information, they wrote an essay summarizing their thoughts, insights, and feelings. I believe that this unit is important to teach in any school district because it can be an opportunity for black students to see themselves positively portrayed in history, which as we know seldom happens. Most commonly, we learn about black history as it pertains to slavery, and that might be the only time that black students ever see someone who looks like themselves in their studies. Even in schools with small black populations like where I teach, it's just as important for students to see positive and empowering black figures to break pre-existing stereotypes and make an effort to create compassion and acceptance. 
It is important that we learn to guard against the tendency of becoming so wrapped up in our own work that we forget to investigate the work of others. The true teacher must always be on the lookout for the good things which the experience of others has given and is giving to the world, and with careful judgment, discarding the useless or inferior plans to fill their places with improved ones. Keep your eyes open for the light. Work with sincerity of purpose. Have no fear when your pet theories are demolished, for nothing that is right can be destroyed, and the destruction of the false makes way for the true. Crane alumna Jennifer Moore states that it is an overwhelming honor to be recognized as one of the many extraordinary Crane women in music education. Her own school music teacher, Terry Salsgiver, was also a Crane graduate and is the reason why she ultimately chose to enter this deeply rewarding profession. Dr. Campbell has been perhaps the most influential presence in her thinking, wondering and daring to take on projects that require far-reaching webs of interaction between school and community resources for students of all ages. Dr. Collins' invitation to contribute to her Curious Collaborative Creativity Project prompted a real shift in moving from imagining what could be to taking action and creating new possibilities in our music learning and presentations. In the words of Jennifer Moore, Music education at Willsboro Central School is about opportunity. To borrow Christopher Small's term, we are a musicking school. Students have opportunities to gauge as much or as little as they desire. Students can sing at Carnegie Hall, the local Grange Hall, or the community nursing home. They can learn their favorite songs on ukuleles or the piano, create podcasts, design and build instruments with a makey-makey device or old-fashioned wood glue and tape. They can participate in traditional festival ensembles or explore multicultural practices with visiting artists. They can hold the Instrument of Hope, designed by the survivors of the Parkland shooting, or the Stradivarius violin of a master teacher as she prepares her teaching space. All of these opportunities are designed and curated to provide students with the skills and experiences they need to step into a larger world and know that they too can make valuable contributions to their community at any age.
to send out young teachers convinced that they have reached the final dictum of the educational world is to assure their failure. That they may not have achieved success for a year or two, I cannot deny, but to expect progressive teachers to be developed by such training is to expect the impossible. Progress only comes to those who are willing to learn, and the highest success to those who dig for the truth as for hid treasure. Melinda Phoenix Hart is a proud Crane alumna who continues to learn and progress as a highly skillful teacher. She, learned both her or she earned both her Bachelor of Music and Master of Music here at SUNY Potsdam. She is in her 13th year of teaching and currently teaches K-5 through general music and 4th through 5th chorus at North Broad Elementary and Durhamville Elementary, both located in the Oneida City School District. Melinda feels honored and grateful to be among the distinguished women music educators receiving recognition this evening. The first step for creative teaching is to reach the student on a personal level, understanding their world to the best of my abilities in order to better understand the context from which they will be engaging in learning within my classroom. This is achieved through conversations, lunches, and expressing genuine interest, attending dance recitals, basketball games, and shows happening outside school. Learning about the latest video trend on TikTok, letting them teach you a new dance move, and the occasional selfie. This is co-founding the Gay Straight Alliance for Middle School Students, looking for community and safety. This is sponsoring a student-run cartoon club and purchasing student art in support of young talent. This is making sure that they have clothes for concerts and events, talking them through a panic attack before auditions, and congratulating them after. Once the connection is made, students have an easier time exploring music through creative avenues, like exploring elements of music through Chrome Lab, creative composing using GarageBand, coding, and non-traditional instruments. Exploring musical venues and music history using virtual reality. Discovering acoustics through the strings of a ukulele. Realizing that music is a language while learning to read, write, and notate their musical ideas. Connecting with other students, their community, and the world through sharing their creations, and seeing the potential of what the future could hold with guest artists sharing their knowledge and passion for music as a career. My students and I collaborate on a variety of levels, starting with working together to establish a creative learning environment that works to the advantage of each student, without taking away from any other student. Each class establishes normals for behavior and expectations, incorporating ideas like flexible seating or accountability checks. We explore the positive character dispositions necessary for a successful ensemble through games like Jenga. We work together on mindfulness, helping improve focus and clarity of mind, as well as calming the body through breath work. I strive to set an example of teamwork for my students by continuing to collaborate with colleagues at the local level and beyond, including maintaining a connection with Crane faculty, alumni, and students, hosting student teachers, being part of presentations and panels, accompanying and creating motivational videos help share a visual example of collaboration for my students. Although it sounds simple, my most memorable musical experiences with students are often the day-to-day -day moments, but there are some big memories worth sharing, such as taking a group of young singers to Hershey Park, singing the national anthem at a Syracuse Crunch hockey game, caroling for festive audiences, Veterans Day concerts where students taught the audience about a Paumia remembrance table. Winning the It's a Zoo literary musical competition with student collaboration. Helping a group of passionate middle school students arrange a rockin' rendition of Come Sail Away. Encouraging a shy kid who wasn't really liking baseball to try out for chorus in fourth grade, then listening to his college audition songs nine years later. Working with young theater students in show after show and seeing them pursue their passion in college and beyond. Introducing a student to GarageBand, arranging one of his songs for a chorus to sing, and a few years later learning that he just dropped his first album. The countless notes and letters, chats over coffee, and pictures sent to me by students who have long since left my classroom. Thank you for the honor of sharing my students and a few of our experiences with you this evening.
These are just some of the treasures Dr. Collins uncovered during her research of Julia E. Crane and the stories of our Crane alumni and students. We invite you to read more in her book, Messengers of Music, The Legacy of Julia E. Crane, available from Information Age Publishing, Amazon, and in our campus bookstore. Thank you to the Crane women in music education that continue to make a positive impact on the lives of children and adults alike. Julia Crane's favorite song was Annie Laurie. It is a tradition that her ensemble, the Phoenix Club, continues to sing this song at selected performances. Members of the Phoenix Club are here this evening to share this song with you. At this time, while the song is sung, Dr. Collins would like to present award certificates to the selected Crane women in music education.
And now it's time to honor, thank you so much, it's beautiful, it's beautiful. Now it's time to honor those who are able to be present tonight, who are the Crane Women in Music Education. Congratulations to Dr. Katherine Sherman. And Mrs. Tracy Wanamaker. And Miss Jennifer Moore. <laughs> uh, Melinda Phoenix Hart. Is she able to be here? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Diana McEntee. Thank you all for coming this evening and sharing this event with us. Please join us for refreshments in the lobby with our Crane Women in Music Ed. Thank you.